I suppose the idea is, if you name a thing, you can control it. There are things in this world that cannot be named. The Vanishing of Ethan Carter is a mystery adventure game where you play a supernatural detective in search of a young boy who had their line of contact abruptly interrupted. The detective enters the town of Red Creek Valley in order to try and save him from a threat that encroaches upon the town. The game opens with you entering a forest on a train track that leads directly to town, and if you stay on the path, it will take you directly to find Ethan. You pass the first body, you enter the town to find his house was burned down. You find that there is a cult that treats the raven as a god. Using both inane intuition for reason, as well as a supernatural gift to view moments before somebody has died, the information shows that Ethan is in grave danger and it may already be too late to find him. But as you are on your way, if you tread off the beaten path, which you may have to do at times to find certain clues, you will stumble across these stories that Ethan has written and left around. These stories trigger heavy hallucinations from the protagonist in a more arresting style than the hallucinations one receives from seeing pre-death moments. The stories take a huge part of the game, but they detract from what's important, getting to Ethan on time. But in your sense of discovery, they take up such a major part of play, which leads us to this conflict. Wanting to know more about who we are trying to reach, and actually reaching that person. The foreground, and the background. We have to get to him. But who is he? The protagonist knows who it is, but we as the players do not. Listen to yourself. No. I see clearly. As the story progresses, we find out that the villain of the story is this sleeper who must wake and is feeding off the suffering of others. So as long as people are alive and in pain, the sleeper stays alive. As long as there is conflict, the sleeper will eventually wake. The protagonist feels the sleeper watching him and is afraid of not being able to reach him in time. We discover through the story about how the sleeper awakens a bloodlust in his family, and how the brother and the mother think they need to sacrifice Ethan. The uncle tries to kill him, but his body is disposed of in a fire-lit cemetery. The father and grandfather are passive resistances against the forces of the sleeper and commit suicide. The father by cutting his throat with scissors, and the grandfather by self-immolation. While not assailed by the forces of the sleeper, we traverse the story and manage to find Ethan asleep in an underground bunker, alive. Above him is a map of the island, with little icons mapping out the background stories and their locations. One of the stories, which is where the bunker ends, is the detective's story. Your story is among them. The foreground has been the background the entire time. Through subtle uses of imagery, through the unveiling of the plot and the elements of the side stories, we can see all of Ethan Carter. The portrait of a kid who just wants to escape. Who gets so caught up in his stories and his head, he forgets where he is or how much time has passed. Like in the story, outcast by most of his family, and has to watch as the people who defend him are chastised and hurt. A boy who writes about monsters. About outcasts. About escape about death, and about the hereafter. We watch this boy unravel from the inside as the outside closes in. Our story is the culmination of all of Ethan's stories that show a bleak parallel to the darker truth of what is presently happening to our author. By using the background stories and blending them with our own, it's not a story of rescue at all. It's a story about a man about to meet his maker. 